Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. Don't worry, you're not watching the wrong channel. Just roll with it. Hello, uh, well, this this is actually the first ever live uh, episode of uh, Podcast Tyler's a Spook. Also, first video episode of Podcast Tyler's a Spook. Uh, so, anyway, welcome to Podcast Tyler's a Spook. I'm James Weeks, and today I am joined by Henry Connolly from the PodQuest. Uh, shoot, I'm going to... I came up with a name for you, and I can't even remember. The PodQuest of Bread PodQuest uh, to go podcast of bread podcast uh to you, you know well uh, there we go there we go i i can remember things <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that old i didn't smoke that much weed when i was a kid but let's see uh anyway henry why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself uh and your show and i'll tell them about my show and then we can uh just talk from there all right um so my name is henry conley uh well, I'm I'm a general left anarchist libertarian, um, and uh, you know came into the Libertarian Party back in 2016. Um, came in through the typical routes. Thought I was an ANCAP, you know. Thought I was on that side of things. And uh, uh, James, along with a few other people, reached out to me and started teaching me about this side of the uh, the side of the political spectrum in it in general. Uh, and ever since then, I've been on a steady journey further and further left. And uh, in in part of that, that's where I created the PodQuest of Bread. It didn't have a name until James kind of popped the idea into my head, uh, knowing that I am a fan of the Conquest of Bread. So it was a perfect play off of it. And uh, the PodQuest of Bread, I mean, it started out really as a, a, a current event style thing. I was highly inspired by Bo of the Fifth Column. Uh, and his format of doing videos. So I, I started out really modeling after him. And now in a post-Trump presidency, when we're watching liberals go to brunch and pretend that everything's all good now that Biden's in office, I decided we're going to reformat the entire pod quest um, where we're going to do live interviews with left activists and leftist uh, um, 
candidates for office. And then also um, two to three times a week, we're going to be dropping 20 to 30 minute long videos discussing setting up the, the groundwork and, you know, putting the roots together to build a leftist slash anarchist society and eventually move to a stateless society. And that's that's the entire goal of this podcast now that I have it run it that way. With my podcast, you know, I pretty much just find someone, make absolutely no plans whatsoever, and then just talk with them for however long we talk. Uh, no, no short, no short format. You know, show formats are a spook and all that. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of what you know I I do with my podcast, and uh, you know, podcast titles are spook dot com for those who are watching first hearing about my uh, podcast now. You know, you can check it out on the website. Um, you know, and. Uh, you know, so you got into left, you know, you started off as a, you know, a more right wing anarchist. Where were you before that, though? Did you come from, you know, a Republican back? You know, a lot of people don't start off as anarchists from, you know, childhood and, you know, their parents and school teaching and all that kind of. Wh where was it that you first started at before you came the whole right across the bottom of the political <laughs> spectrum? How, how did you get down, you know, to the bottom in the first place? So, you know, growing up, I, I grew up in a highly conservative household. My grandma was raising me because, you know, family history just hasn't been well for my entire family as a whole. So I grew up in a very conservative household. Um, my grandmother, she was actually a highly bigoted woman. And one of the things that she did um, try to do for me was to instill in me this... Uh, this idea that I would not be like her. She did everything in her power um, to show me that the way she was taught and the way she grew up uh, was wrong. So even though I was, I was raised on these conservative values, I always kind of pushed back against them when I saw that something was wrong, whether it was homophobia, transphobia, um, anything like that. So I, I identified as a Republican. I considered myself a Republican um, in 2012, my first time I was able to vote in the presidential election, I voted for the Republican. I didn't feel right about it, though. There was something always wrong there. I, uh, Like I said, I had an immense amount of support for the GSM community. I believe that sex work was something that, you know, there was nothing wrong with it. Um, and I, I smoked weed, so <laughs> I was automatically pushing against them on that there. Um, and I kind of towed the line and pretended to be a Republican, uh, until 2016, 2016 was really the breaking point for me. Um, I saw the Republican party leaning towards Donald Trump. I saw all the cards lining up for that. And I, I just said, I could not at all support this guy. So I started to look for a new home and I had a really good friend of mine, Ben Kaliski, who was posting about Gary Johnson at the time. And I saw who he was, listened to a couple speeches of his, looked into what the Libertarian Party was, and I said, you know what, this could be my new political home. Um, so that's that's really got where I got my start, 2016, Gary Johnson. I laid low for probably about a year and a half there, um, and somewhere in 2017, 2018 is when I attended my first meeting with a county party, and that's when I started getting involved. And of course, my county party, and I love a lot of the people there, but there are a lot of handicaps. So I automatically started getting, you know, introduced to that side of the political spectrum. And it wasn't until I started having questions about that yet again uh, and getting introduced to you and a few other people that led me down further <laughs> towards anarchy and then shot me way the heck over to left field. So here I am and it, I, the grass is green over here. I like it. <laughs> yeah, we we got bread. <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> but yeah, the um, you know, I also went on a ridiculous journey um, all over the place trying to find a political home. You know, uh, but one thing that I had uh, that very much helped me that I don't think a lot of people did is actually when I was in um, grade school in my uh, civics class, there was a project that was assigned to us by, she was a very new teacher. Um, and, you know, I would always argue with my teachers coming up. You know, I would always argue with them, argue with them, argue with them. You know, I never believed shit they told me. Um, I thought they were always lying to me and I was there to prove that. And oftentimes I did. 
Uh, and so, but there was one that it was a project to, you know, come up with her ideal government. And, you know, I was like, well, I, w- I don't want any government. And uh, they're like, well, that's you're an anarchist. And that's kind of it went downhill from there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, um, it wasn't until after that, you know, that I went and joined the workforce and, you know, got into, you know, factory work that I started to actually like read theory and stuff like that and really kind of examine the situation uh, that I was in and, you know, what what was the cause of it? You know, why was I working in a factory where there's, you know, uh, older, older ladies that are, uh, hurt that need surgery, but you know, they can't take the time off of work to go get, you know, the, um, the surgery they need on their foot. So, you know, what, what, you know, that is stuff like that. And then when I tried to unionize, uh, the first factory I worked at, I got fired for it. Uh, they ended up saying I had bad parts, um, and, uh, good excuse. Fi- yeah. Good excuse. Right. Good excuse. <laughs> they said I had, I was, had bad parts, so they fired me, but it was right after I was trying to unionize it. Um, and I fucked up the unionizing. I was talking about it at work. You know, I didn't know what, what I was doing. Yeah. I had no clue. You know, I had, I had no clue what I was doing. I was not linked up with any unions or anything. I had no organization training or anything like that. Uh, I just saw the working conditions and they're like, we need a fucking union. Uh, yep. And, you know, that that's kind of what happened there. And, um, you know, that set me down where I am uh, today. And, uh, you know, I don't know why the hell I joined the Libertarian Party, to be honest with you. Uh, but I ended up doing that and, um, have been, you know, been there ever since, uh, being an idiot, I guess, but not, not, not being wanted. You know, when, when I first joined the libertarian party, they wanted to immediately kick me out. Uh, (laughs) they, they called when I, when I was first elected vice chair of my County party, they called it a hostile anarchist takeover and the state party attempted to disaffiliate my county party over that. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've been there in the trenches uh, fighting against a lot of um, anti-anarchist uh, stuff for, for a while now. Um, and uh, I don't know. It, it's fun. You know, it's, 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 it's good fun. Hey, you, sometimes you've it, arguably you know, given uh, us the most uh, famous libertarian moment ever too. So you know, I mean, yeah, that's true for, for those that are that listening that may not know who I am, uh, may not recognize me anymore. And my, uh, my new <laughs> physique, uh, you know, I, I, I once, uh, stripped down, you know, I was the guy who stripped down to the thong at the libertarian party, 2016 convention. Um, you know, that, that was me. You probably recognize the beard a little bit, though. The beard, <laughs> beard, beard, beard game's still strong. Um, but the, uh, you know, what, what, so it was Gary Johnson you said that brought you in, or uh, your friend posting about Gary Johnson? Yeah. So my friend posted a bunch of stuff about Gary Johnson. And I, I believe one of the videos that I saw from Gary Johnson that my friend posted was one where he was openly talking about how he smokes weed. And I'm going, yo, if someone's running for president and they're just blatantly throwing that out there, there's got to be something cool that I'm missing over here. And that's when I started looking into him more and then in turn the party. And uh, it just sounded right to me. And, uh, you know, I, I was just joking with someone earlier today, you know, looking back on it, I have to be some sort of masochist for the fact that I joined the party and I'm still pushing as hard as I am. Um, but it's, it's been a worthwhile journey and, you know, rooted all back to Gary Johnson. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gary, Gary Johnson was a, um, as, as far as libertarian candidates go, um, he, he was all right. You know, um, he, he was not like, uh, the worst, the worst we could have had. Um, <laughs> There's, we definitely, Most we definitely, definitely. Hey, there was definitely much worse Libertarian Party candidates than Gary Johnson. I think that, uh, let's be honest, we could have had Bill Weld in his place. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, I mean I'm glad even Bill, even Bill Weld. I mean, even Bill Weld. I mean, as, as Bill, much as faults Bill Weld has, I really like Bill Weld as a Republican. You know, I like yeah. Bill Weld as a Republican. Um, I think when it comes, I mean, this is like the least stinky dog shit. 
you know, when we're saying this, but Bill Weld is like probably the best Republican, but he's the worst libertarian. Oh, yeah. You know, but not not even really. I mean, there are far worse libertarians than him that run. You know, you got Tom Woods and, you know, Dave Smith and all these alt right Absolutely. guys. Yeah. You know, there are far worse libertarians. I mean, you got Ron Paul, you know, I mean, come on. Uh, you know, Bill, Bill Weld is I would I would take Bill Weld over Ron Paul any day of the week. I Most mean, that definitely. doesn't really say much. It doesn't say much at all. But, you know. Um, it's the difference between a turd and a polished turd. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, still got a turd. <laughs> And at least at least Bill Weld isn't, you know, out there. He he's very elitist, but at least he's not elitist and racist. You Correct. know, like, he, like it's sad that that's the bar. You know, it's really sad that that's the bar is is just like not racist. The you fact know, that like, the bar has been set that uh, shows like, the work we have to do. Yeah, there, there's a lot of work to be done. But you know, the the thing is, you know, the Libertarian Party. Uh, is is the third largest political party in America. And you got to keep in mind, you know, libertarian is it's a left libertarian word, you know, is Joseph yep. de uh who Absolutely. coined the term. Uh it's it's left anarchist word. Um, you know, Joseph de Jacques was the first person to identify politically as a libertarian. Um, you know, it, it let, allowing it to be co-opted to mean this paleo conservative hoppy and nonsense that it has come to mean in recent years is, uh, I, it might be a silly fight, but I, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've done, I've done sillier things than, than fight over a word. I don't think it's a silly fight, honestly. Um, I think it's a valid fight. Um, cause you know, when you look at it, um, and you look at the history, that's, you're right. It's we are what it originated from. And sure, you can be a part of this and not be on our side of things, but at least recognize the history. You know, the the Hopians that are in the party, um, the people that want to kill everybody left a Pinochet, um, they are trying to pretend that we aren't valid. We don't exist in here. And that's that's just no, <laughs> it's not a stupid fight. You, know, you just got to wake them up. Mm hmm. Also, if you allow the big concern is if you allow Hoppians to take over and completely control the third largest political party in America, you know, that that could be uh, for a really scary future. If, yeah. if you allow the alt-right pipeline um, that comes from the libertarian right to really take hold and really gravitate that party towards that, um, that could be really dangerous, especially right now uh, in the age of Trump and Trumpism, yeah. um, where it, it does appear that, uh, you know, the MAGA red caps are looking for uh, a new political home. And I, I guarantee they will, especially after the words of Mitch McConnell today during mm -hmm. the impeachment hearing, which I don't know if you if you watched any of that. I was watching um, a bit at work, you um, know, so Mitch McConnell really, really drove uh, a point home that that stuff is not welcome in the GOP. I, I felt like he, he did that. And because of that, I think you're going to see a mass exodus of a lot of those uh, MAGA type people. And they may try and gravitate towards that. And with the already existent libertarian right to alt-right pipe pipeline, you're going to see that magnified tenfold, especially through the Mises caucus and yep. welcoming in people who uh, support closed border policies, uh, anti-choice uh, legislation, and, and that type of really far-right reactionary policies. Um, if, if we welcome that in into the libertarian fold uh, and recruit from that base, uh, you're going to see those Trump people come in and really take the third largest political party. And then that would be when it would finally gain any sort of political seats um, yeah. is, is through that. And you're going to see a lot of people that are, um, you know, willing to compromise their, you know, libertarian integrity uh, to, to have that right unity, um, party. Uh, so you're, you're going to see a lot of that through the Mises caucus, um, through right. the border Tarians. And so, uh, whether or not we're fighting just over a word 
or fighting over the the way that these MAGA people get into more power. We already have, you know, QAnon uh, Congress people now. Oh, my God. You know. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> like, it's we, funny we, you bring that up, though, because, like, I was talking, you know, over here in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia area, I've been out um, mostly over the summer. Um, I was out with uh, Refuse Fascism up in Philadelphia. Um, I was out with a lot of different Black Lives Matter activists. We were raising hell. We <laughs> we shut down an entire city block when Trump decided to come to Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, we had Secret Service pretty much watching over us, uh, videotaping every one of us. There were fights almost breaking out. It was It was getting pretty lit up. I was talking with someone the other day about um, the the Trump MAGA hats looking for a new home. And I I don't think it's going to be immediate, although we are already seeing uh, Mises and their their kin uh, reaching out to these people. I don't think it will be immediate. My What I said to them is, I believe once they try to set up this Patriot Party and they try and do this and they realize how hard it is to establish a political party mm -hmm. in the United States, that's when they're going to seek a new home. And that's when we'll see the influx. And that's why we need to build this coalition now, get it ready, get it going, and and, and fight. be ready to fight these people. Because they're, they're coming. Whether it's in a year or two years, they're coming. And we have to be ready to push them out. Because mm -hmm. the Republican Party, it's on its deathbed. And once the Republican Party collapses, libertarians go from being the third largest to the second largest. And that's where we have to be ready to make sure that the MAGA hats are not controlling our party. It's true. The GOP is in its death throes right now. Trump has not only broken America, but he broke the GOP. Yep. Um, you know, he, he really has done a number on uh, that party. It's 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 wild it's is wild to yeah. see um you know and it's funny to see them try and like shift back into their old talking points now with biden it's like now all of a sudden the deficit matters yep you know now all of a sudden it's about to, you know like it, it, now all it, of a sudden everybody yeah. needs to unite like yeah. suddenly yeah, yeah. Sud ignore, suddenly ignore january 6th yeah that didn't yeah. happen that wasn't us yeah <laughs> It's like, oh, why can't we just all get along now? Like they're trying to shift back into that after after the last four years of you know of Trumpism, and but you know there's some resistance in there, and you know um, you got Ted Cruz, who you know has really, you know Ted Cruz has been wild, you know he wouldn't oh, even yeah. defend his wife against Trump. Yeah, it, it, the amount of people within their party that are still. <sighs> risking their political careers on this guy is insanity. It's just insane. Um, and I've been trying to put in the words, like what we're witnessing within it. And the only thing I can come up with is that his cult of personality is so great. It's so grand over that party that it's going to infect the party top to bottom, which quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, let it because it'll just cause it to collapse quicker. Um, mm -hmm. And the sooner we get rid of one of the two, you know, corporate parties, the better, in my opinion. Now, how surprised are you about how the um, impeachment trial turned out? Were you expecting an acquittal, or were you expecting um, Trump to be uh, convicted? I fully expected an acquittal. I didn't think we would see as many Republicans as um, some people thought. Jump ship. Um, the one thing I would say, though is with how hard McConnell was railing against Trump post-vote, if he had been a yes vote for conviction, we might have seen a different story play out. We might be talking right now about Trump actually being uh, found guilty on the charge. But I just, you know, without that McConnell vote, I didn't see anybody else falling in line besides who we did. I mean, mm -hmm. and we saw, you know, people we expected to me, we, we expected Romney um, and we expected a couple of the other people that fell onto the, you know, vote for charging him. Um, what I will say is, yeah, we failed. They failed there. They absolutely failed in impeaching him uh, or sorry, convicting him. Um, but now this just sets up another um, 
hurdle that he's going to have to go through in the hopes of being able to, you know, possibly run in 2024. I mean, you got Georgia investigating him. You got SDNY looking into, uh, you know, bringing charges against him. If either one of those bring charges against him, that could completely screw his chances for 2024. And as far as I'm concerned, let's, I, I hope it sticks. Um, because the 2024 crowd in the Republican Party is already looking pretty horrifying. <laughs> well, who else? Is, who else, has anyone else announced or have said that I have not followed that at all? Well, so the biggest name that's rumored that concerns me is Tom Cotton, because Tom mm. Cotton is, you know, he's he's a young, more charismatic Trump who is way better with words, and that's what scares me. It's like. Tom Cotton can sit there and spin his words, <laughs> and instead of sounding like a racist asshole, he comes across as this intelligent, intellectual person. And the MAGA hats would likely flock to him. And if he gets the nomination and say one in 2024, I'm booking the first ticket out of this country. I'm going to <laughs> another country. I'm getting out of here because Tom Cotton would be the, oh, I don't even want to imagine it. We thought so we were on the brink of fascism. Tom Cotton is fascism. Well, I mean, Trump was fascism too, but he was a, a incompetent fascism. Correct. You know, he he was not really good at his plans. Uh, he was not very competent. I mean, he couldn't even pull off a coup. I mean, he <laughs> totally had, he totally had the army that he could have done to do that. Mm -hmm. um, he couldn't even pull that one off. Oh yeah, yeah that was that was so. Uh, like with the manpower he had already, um, you know, and the support of the police already and the national guard already standing down. And, you know, he had like everything chips in place and he couldn't even pull that one off. And exactly. it's a good thing. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a really, it's a really, it's a really good, good thing. Really yeah. Good thing. It's a really good thing. He's incompetent, but yes, you're, you're definitely right. The next thing that comes out of the MAGA crowd is going to be extremely scary. Um, because uh, it it won't be as incompetent as Trump. The next the next one won't be that um, so full of himself and uh, you know more of like an egomaniac uh, type type deal with Trump. You know where he was just uh, completely self centered and about everything he did and uh, could see no wrongdoing. You know not necessarily. Um, I guess the, but the point I'm making is that he thought no matter what he did, it would work. And, and see, the other thing I fear about that crowd, too, and um, I haven't seen really anybody talking about this, and that's the one thing that I'm I'm not liking about everybody that's in opposition to this <laughs> right now is we need to start talking about this. Um, so many of these people that were MAGA hats that were, you know, uh, whether they were Proud Boys, uh, you know, three percenters, whatever – they are a lot, you know, a core group of them. They were QAnon supporters, and now they're watching all this QAnon stuff turn out to be false, which is just riling them up even more. And now that Trump voluntarily left the White House, these people are sitting in their chat groups wherever they are. They are trying to figure out what the next step forward is. So if they get their way, if they get someone that's more charismatic, the problem that I also fear is these people are going to be willing to be a lot more violent for that person than they were for someone who was less, in, you know, inspiring uh, in Trump. You know, that's where my worry would be. Proud Boys, they've already stepped away from Trump. They've already told Trump to go fuck off. They're looking for their next person. And whoever that next person is, is they've already seen what Proud Boys will do. My concern is what they will use Proud Boys to to do mm -hmm. you know stand down and stand by that was a scary thing to see a president say mm -hmm. the next one might not be saying stand down and stand by and that's especially with their hatred of you know anti-fascists that's where we need to be extremely prepared uh, and the uh, proud boys have already been attempting to infiltrate the libertarian party for years now through the mises caucus yes yeah, so, they, there, there's, there's this one thing that keeps coming up there that we need to, we need to fight against, and that's that's my push. You know, anybody that knows me, I left the party for a few months over the summer. I took a break, 
And when I came back in, I, I made it abundantly clear. The Mises caucus is my target and the Mises caucus leaving the LP is my goal. I, anything short of that, I'm not going to be a happy person. And whether it takes me recreating you on stage in Reno, I don't care. <laughs> you know, we got to get them out of here. You're going to have to grow your beard out a little bit for that. Maybe put on a few pounds. I'm working on it. It's <laughs> normal. <laughs> Well, the more the more radical you get, the bigger your beard gets. <laughs> that's, that's how that, that's how that works. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I just tell people that, but it has worked out for me. The more radical I've gotten over the years, but bigger my beard gets. <laughs> but the um, the uh, you know the, the whole thing with the you know the Mises Caucus and um, you know the. It really ties in with every, everything that's going on in this country is going on. And, and, and then in the DNC, too, in the Democratic Party, you know, you have these, you know, neoliberals that want to, you know, think everything's fine now that Biden's out of office that are now going to be fighting against the anti-fascists during yep. during Trump's, uh, you know, regime. Um, you know, we at least had some backing of. Uh, you know, the liberals. Correct. Um, yep. Now that Biden is there, uh, we're going to lose that on a lot of important issues like um, kids in cages. Yeah. Like uh, the immigration policy, various wars. I mean, I'm already starting to see the push uh, for war with Iran. Correct. Um, yep. You know, and we, we can't have that. We can't have more war. And just I mean, also while you're talking about possible okay. wars, you know, and, and one of the things that I pride myself on is that I'm I stay up to date pretty heavily on, you know, troop movements and all that stuff. And I, I think that's a something that's everybody should be um, aware of. Um, but we also just sent uh, B1B Lancers over into the Netherlands. We're sending them there for what reason? A show of force against Russia. I mean, these are things that neoliberals are just going to ignore and pretend like, oh, well, this is so this is all fine. No, it's not fine. Sending mm -hmm. B1Bs to to Netherlands would be like Russia sending one of its uh, Tupolovs into Canada. We wouldn't support that. We wouldn't stand for that. And suddenly that's fine. If this was Trump sending those B1Bs over into the Netherlands, you know they would have been up in arms about it and they would have been raging. And that's why I say they're out the brunch. I mean, mm -hmm. you're already seeing them say they don't care, you know, to be knowledgeable on who the secretary of uh, education is. You know, they this is a very, very scary time for folks like us because we are losing a major backing. And that's that's not good at all. <laughs> Now, on something uh, a little lighter, I guess, have you seen <laughs> this uh, video of this uh, trial that was going on over Zoom? Oh, the cat video? The cat video. Now, have you have you seen this video? Yes, For, I have. Uh, now, I don't know if this is possible. Let's find out. Can I can I do this? No, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to work this program. But anyway, everyone go look up. Just Google I'm live here. I'm not a cat. And you got to watch this video. It's the funniest thing ever. And, you know, the, the real story is it is that cats had actually taken over the lawyer's office and were holding the lawyer hostage. Uh, it, it was actually a cat. <laughs> <laughs> no. I have to say the funniest part about that whole video is if you look in the top left corner, um, it says how recording this video or recording the meeting is not allowed, you know, under XYZ law. And I'm, <laughs> I'm just sitting there like whoever recorded this at risk of being punished under law. Thank you. Cause that yeah, was yeah. absolutely amazing. It, it's, it was, it's perfect. It's, it's absolutely perfect that someone risked their, uh, risk their job to bring us that, that beautiful, beautiful clip of a lawyer not being able to figure out his zoom avatar if um, only that that happened at the end of 2020 that would have been the perfect cherry mm -hmm. on top to an yeah. absolutely horrendous year <laughs> it would have it would have but it really is helping with 2021 getting off to the right start yes is, is you know we we now have had a lawyer get stuck now you know i'd really like to have seen like because they did a lot of the depositions over zoom for the impeachment trial that would have been really cool if like nancy pelosi got stuck in in a uh, a cat filter um 
that that would have been uh, very interesting. And I hope that uh, one day when Trump is on Zoom trial uh, for the stuff, because, you know, he's still going to be held responsible, yep. that Trump also gets stuck in a cat filter and has to tell the judge, I'm not a cat. <laughs> because one of, the really things I, one of the things I hope for is that McConnell's forced to like testify for Trump or something like that. And someone invents a turtle filter for him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. McConnell needs a turtle filter. (laughs) McConnell needs a turtle filter for sure. Uh, He definitely does. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, 2020 was a wild year, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. It was like one thing after. And what happened with murder hornets? Um, No one knows. Like that, that was like a thing for like a day. That murder yep. hornets were, were here, and then like it just disappeared from the news permanently. And uh, but it's did that funny. actually happen, or was that like a collective hallucination we all had, where we all imagined that murder hornets were here, and then all of a sudden, or was there like some kind of weird time shift of like <laughs> like I'm I'm trying to figure out where they went. No, the there was uh, yeah, up. they just went through it. They just they just got out of here. They came and went as fast. It it's like, funny when that came up. I follow a channel on YouTube called. Uh, Coyote Peterson. And the only reason I followed him is because he did this whole series where he just voluntarily got bitten stung by like everything you don't want to get bitten mm-hmm. stung by. And the moment they brought up murder, uh, murder hornets, I'm like, I swear I've heard of these Asian giant hornets. And I look it mm-hmm. up. I'm like, oh shit. Yeah, it is. It's exactly what he got stung by. I don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. yeah, like you said, it disappeared out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. It, like they, they were here and then they were gone. It was so fast. Well, their reinforcements, um, they were flying over here. This is the only thing I can theorize. They were flying over here, saw how fucked we were with COVID and turned around and flew back where they came. Yeah. Maybe that's, COVID, maybe COVID killed them all. Maybe they all got COVID. That's also, who you knows? Know, it's, it's valid. Who knows? Maybe, maybe like the, the first ones got here, they tried stinging someone with COVID and ended up dying of COVID. You know, who knows? What's this uh, weird cough? Yeah, it also we got mur- coughing murder hornets. Could you imagine that? Like you're, you're trying, you're just all of a sudden you hear just a, a whole swarm of wasps just coughing as they fly towards you. Like how scary would that be? I'll, I'll tell you what, with with how crazy 2020 was, and uh, on on New Year's Eve, like I didn't say Happy New Year. I I, I refused because I'm convinced. Me and my roommate saying that last year was like a curse. I, I'm I'm a hundred percent convinced on it. But I'm not gonna lie, when twelve o'clock hit, or when midnight hit, I was waiting to hear a booming voice from the sky going round two. And just like <laughs> see see I uh started the new year I started twenty twenty one um out perfectly is I queued up uh Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. So exactly when the clock struck midnight Emperor Palpatine executed order 66. So the, the minute the clock, I queued it up perfectly right at the very second, boom, execute order 66. Uh, and that's how I rang in the, the new year. And it seemed to have paid off because uh, the only thing that's happened so far is an insurrection. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I guess you did a good job on that one. Yeah. <laughs> two months in only thing happened in insurrection but you know that's uh it is something this this whole um i'll tell you what I'll, I'll being that you say that if that's that's the good luck charm we've had so far then you must be the good luck reason why i found this apartment that i have because yeah. i mean i'll, I'll take roommate, credit you're looking at eviction <laughs> all right i'm take i'll take credit for that too I'll take credit for everything. Give me, <laughs> give me all the credit. I also take blame too. If you want to blame me for everything, take all the, put all the blame on me. Um, no, I'll take blame for 2020. I, <laughs> all right. I promise. Can, I can say happy that. new year this year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the thing with uh, 2020 too, is just like the, just the, the, it just seemed like it, like it went on forever, but was also like super quick. Yep. Did you notice that too? Oh yeah. It, it, and I, I somehow I, I credit that to the fact that every week there was something, mm-hmm. you know, and in the weeks that there wasn't something crazy happening, I, I you're just you were watching the the amount of people, you know, and and me personally, um, watching the amount of people that were suffering and you know seeing the foundational cracks in the system we have. Um, 
that kept it going for me because it kept a, a you know a constant conversation being able to happen. So it helped it go fast, but yeah, it drug along too. <laughs> One thing I noticed that was really amazing that came out of uh, 2020 was the combination of you know the, the the second civil rights movement in America being birthed, and then at the same time seeing capitalism's failures of handling the coronavirus. Um, has really brought like a resurgence of interest in leftist politics too. Definitely. Um, to where a lot of people who started the year uh, more um, right wing have now ended the year uh, more left. Um, and I've seen people go all the way just over the course of a year. They were an ANCAP last year at this time. Now they're a full blown ANCOM just off of those two things, seeing those two things happen. Um, and I think that that's a beautiful, a beautiful sight, seeing the failures of capitalism in real time, affecting them, um, you know, very, very much, you know, a very deep level, you know, seeing the, uh, the joblessness and uh, how the government only gave a shit about protecting the corporations and yep. uh, seeing how people were all left uh, you know, fucking twelve hundred bucks yeah. and, and six hundred bucks. Joke. The you know, biggest like joke of the whole just, thing. Just slapped in the face. Well, you know, and then and then looking and seeing other countries, seeing countries like Vietnam, a country that not that long ago was basically just bombed out of existence, still whooped the United States' ass in a war. Yep. And then but is still a, a, a impoverished nation, but managed to kick the coronavirus's ass. Yes, uh, and keep you know the uh, less than you know a couple thousand sick and less than fifty people dead in a country with you know a hundred million people and a population density eight times that of Michigan. Yet oh, yeah. somehow capitalist countries that are the richest and wealthiest nations in the in the world with all the fucking resources they could fucking do anything with uh, couldn't even manage to, you know, keep it from getting like a third of all the cases. Yep. You know, and you see the countries that are the beacons of, you know, capitalism in the world, you know, your United Kingdom, your United States. You got Brazil with that fascist Bolsonaro down there yep. are like the top three of uh, where, where it's at, you know, hey, like that's <laughs> see everybody else. It's like there's there's been a dramatic action taken to stop this. And, and in some cases, yeah, OK, maybe it got a little out of hand. But overall, I mean, there are so many countries impoverished, you know, these third world nations, as people would put it in typical terms, they've kicked its butt. How can they do it? We can't, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, we got the, we got medical technology out the, out the ass. We got, we got everything we need to do it and we can't, but I will say one of the things I love about that jumping back to like workers is I've noticed, a, you know, people that were essential workers started seeing, well, Hold on. I, I had to work through this, risking getting this, mm -hmm. risking spreading it to my family, risking dying. I got my standard pay. I didn't get any sort of hazard pay, but the big man upstairs, he made money hand and hand over mm -hmm. fist. You know, I'm, I'm noticing that a lot of those people are going, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on. Something's yeah. not right here. And, and it's that type of thing that really just helps kind of further the cause you know they're right. they're stumbling into that left side without even realizing they are and that's yeah. beautiful they're, they're developing that class consciousness they're seeing the fact that a, right a year ago today they were called unskilled labor mm -hmm. you know and and now it's essential labor with a you know, flip of a switch. With, with a flip of a way. switch, it w it went from unskilled, doesn't deserve you know fifteen dollars an hour, doesn't even deserve the seven twenty five they're making kind of attitude with them. Oh, you're you know you're just a it's a throwaway job, you know. With a flip of a switch, it became um. You're you you're, you're crucial. 
Yeah, exactly. And then to see without you, we'd yeah. all die. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, exactly. Without you, everyone society would crumble to a halt without your labor. Correct. And it, yep. it went from uh, ad, and then, um, w- and then it was like we don't even want to give you hazard pay. And then, meanwhile, the companies that they're working for are making record profits, record yep. profits, Absolutely. never before seen record profits. And then you see the stock market just going up. And who owns all the stocks? Who owns all the stocks? Yep, you know, all those rich fuckers. <laughs> all, the, all those rich fuckers. And why is the stock market going up? Because Trump's bail, bailing them out. Not only that, oh, Trump's yeah. bailing them out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they're doing stock buybacks to drive the prices up. Uh, the other thing, too, it's like the other thing that I think woke a lot of people up throughout this whole thing. It, it all roots back to that stimulus. When, you know, when people were trying to hype it up, like, oh, yeah, we're, the stimulus is, you know, X amount of dollars, but hey, you're getting $1,200. Well, where's the rest going? Oh, military spending. Oh, it's going to, you know, Amazon. It's going to Jeff Bezos. It's going to, you know, Elon Musk. These people that have become exponentially richer during this and these big businesses that are supposed to be too big to fail are getting these buyouts, yet mm-hmm. you're just tossing us some crumbs and hoping we stay silent. I, I'll tell you what, when that happened on Twitter, I saw so many people in the streets mobilizing, people erecting guillotines outside of Jeff Bezos' uh, house in Washington, D.C., people talking about, like, you either you take care of us and you help us, or we're going to fucking burn it down. And, you know, that was a moment of true, like, realization that you cannot have class solidarity with these billionaires. There's It's mm-hmm. not possible. They don't care. No. And that... That government that you thought would help you, they only care to help the corporations because that's who they're owned by. That moment really woke a lot of people up, and that was awesome. I, I saw people that I've been close friends with outside of politics suddenly get political and suddenly get really, really far to the left real quick. So the 20s brought back, you know, we were circled back that because the 1920s, we had a, a, you know, a pandemic and the rise of syndicalism. Hey, hey, 2020s. What's just going on? Come on. Let's go. Let's let's go. (laughs) Let's keep it going. I'm okay with it. (laughs) You know, uh, unfortunately, the rise of fascism also comes, you know, coupled with that, too. And we saw that with Trump. Um, That was a that was a little bit early. But. When, when we see, you know, the kind of um, class solidarity that we're having with people uh, grow, uh, we're seeing class consciousness happen with um, a lot of working class people through this. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people that have realized that the government and corporations don't give a fuck about them. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of people who, who had lost their jobs uh, during this and um, Absolutely. You know, have been left left out to dry. And we're facing some huge problems coming up. Uh, Biden's going to have Biden really has his work cut out for him here. Absolutely. With this housing crisis coming up, something like 40 million people are 40, at, yeah, yeah, 42 million risk, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Risk to lose their homes. It, it, it's going to that's that's going to be quite the the wake up call, I think, for a lot of people. Um, and. Hopefully something I I really do hope that Biden actually comes through and does something about that because it it would be a a huge shame um if if that came you know that happened if we had 40 yeah. million people um lose lose their places to live um over Trump's mishandling of the coronavirus and, and over capitalism's it, failure with the coronavirus. Exactly. People losing their homes because they mm-hmm. lost their jobs. And landlords don't want to understand that. Landlords don't don't care about that. That's the root problem here. You know, so many people um, prior to coronavirus, prior to losing their jobs, prior to, you know, seeing that most landlords have just been like, well, you still owe me 1500 a month. Um, these people that would have you know, prior to all of this stuff sat there and said, well, you know, landlords, they own the property. They can charge me it. Now they're sitting there going, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. (laughs) No, 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 no. I lost my job. (laughs) I I don't have the money to do this. I'm trying to, you know, pay for 
food for my family. Um, you know, I'm trying to bring cans of soup to my family. Um, that that's really awakened a lot of people to what the, the fundamental issue with housing is. And uh, I did a podcast episode on that. And, you know, the United Nations recognizes housing as a fundamental human right. Yet in the United States of America, we don't see it as a fundamental human right. We recognize, you know, in the this country, it's a commodity. You know, it, it's a profit making system and it shouldn't be that way. Um, and I hope more people start to wake up to it. But at the same time, I'm, I'm with you there. I hope Biden does something to try and stop this because 42 million Americans going homeless, um, that can't happen. Because with that, you're going to have suicide rates going up. Um, you're going to have people who are desperate. And and when you, when a human is desperate, that fight or flight instinct takes in. And they're going to do anything to try and keep themselves alive. There is a lot of things that can happen that are coupled with just simply losing that roof over your head. And it, it's got to be addressed. And it's got to be addressed sooner than later. Mm -hmm. And couple that with the fact that it would happen now, even though it was a failure uh, of the Trump administration and capitalism under Trump, there you're going to have them f uh, blame Biden for it if mm -hmm. Biden doesn't adequately uh, address it in time, uh, which he does not have much time left. No, Trump he gave him a ticking time bomb on that. Yep. Um, and if it is successfully spun by the Fox News and Newsmax and OAN propaganda networks, uh, they're not news. Um, you know, if it's, if it's successfully Your spun problem. by those propaganda networks um, to be a failure of Biden, um, and not the reality of it being a failure of capitalism, you're going to see, uh, unfortunately, a huge rise in the support for Trump or the next Trump from those people that lose their homes. Um, cause and, his, and the time period for Biden to act on this is a lot shorter than most people are addressing. You know, let's let's just look back to Georgia when he was when Biden was campaigning in Georgia. He said, we win Georgia. You get two thousand dollars. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. paraphrasing it a bit, but it's essentially what he said. Not fourteen hundred like they're arguing about now. And the fact that he hasn't sent that out yet is the first failure that is going mm -hmm. to set them up to have a, a, a something that we cannot afford to happen, which is twenty twenty two. You know, they got to take actions and they got to, you know, set themselves apart from Trump now, because if they don't in 2022, I promise that every single Republican running from local office, state office, federal office, they are going to make it a fundamental point on their platforms to say that Biden has failed you, the mm -hmm. people, you, you know, Democrats celebrated. Yeah, they flipped the House. They flipped the, the Senate. Yeah, they'll flip back again if you don't get this straight before 2022. That's yeah. just how it is. It'll it'll swing back in a huge way because mm -hmm. all Republicans are going to have to say is, "Look, Biden never got a year two grand." Yep, Biden. You lost your house because you of Biden. Your, yeah, you lost your house because Biden didn't do anything. Even though the Republicans are the ones that hold up and do all that kind of stuff, that's yep. what they're going to do. You know, they're going to claim. Um, that and that's going to allow, um, you know, them to go. And then, you know, you're going to have the added problem with a, a massive exodus of, of the Trump people. Basically, we're in for a, a very bumpy next few years. Uh, I'm actually, you know, because we look back like we look back on Reagan and we can recognize Reagan to be one of the worst presidents the United States has ever had looking Absolutely. at now, uh, not just his, what he did well in power, but the long-term effects and say with Nixon, the long-term effects of their policies and what they did and how they were able to change society and change the government in such a way yes. and how they were able to do so on a global scale with like Operation Condor and all that, you know, all the all this shit that happened during like Reagan and fucking Nixon, and these assholes um, that, <clears throat> you know. It's, it's going to be interesting to see, looking at the long-term effects 
of of what Trump has really done um, and be able to take note uh, now that he's out of office and, you know, next, you know, four or five years, 10 years, decade from now to see the impact that he actually have, because I, I would be willing to bet that the long term effects that Trump has had on this society the policies he put in place, the positions he moved the Overton window to um, will have probably the most drastic uh, harm done to our society in, in this in this uh, in this country that we have ever seen. I mean, we have right now because of Trump and what he has done and how he has moved this country. We have a woman in Congress who believes that Jewish space lasers caused the California wildfires, openly yep. states this, and gets elected because and Trump she's liked her. Of it too. She's proud of it. Like, And the guy she was running against in the primary was like actually a really good candidate as far as like Republican candidates go. Not me. Like, right. I wouldn't vote for him. Fuck him. But like... <laughs> When, when you look at like what would what makes a good traditional Republican candidate, the cutting taxes, the blah, 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 all that stuff, like literally that like she was none of those, but she was oh, yeah. a crazy QAnon conspiracy theorist Trump lover. She, yeah, she made her whole campaign yeah. that she supports Trump and she supports QAnon. Yeah. And that was more than enough to get her elected. And that's because of the cult. You know, I talked throughout the entire Trump presidency about the cult. Um, and I said how dangerous that cult is and how dangerous that cult was going to become. Um, the Trump cult's not a cult like we would traditionally see. And I studied the occult in psychology when I was in sociology. Those were primary focuses were cults and their behaviors. Trump's cult is not like a Jonestown. They're not like a Hale Bob Comet you know, cult. They're not going to kill themselves. They're just going to grow and grow and grow. And when you look at the societal change that Trump has made, one of the most detrimental ones, in my opinion, um, and the one that's going to have the longest lasting effects and be the hardest to repair are the families that have been torn apart because, you know, parents are Trump supporters and QAnon believers and the children were awake and didn't or, you know, you know, uncles or grandparents or whatever. Um, I'm in a, a group on Reddit that is essentially a bunch of, people, it's 41,000 people strong or something like that, uh, who have had family, uh, lost family members to the QAnon cult. That's going to outlast any effects that Trump has, mm -hmm. you know, on a political party. You know, the Republicans, they're going to have to deal with him for four to eight years. That's going to be probably what it will take to rough him out. The division of families, that's going to last far longer and I fear what the mental health issues that are going to arise from that are going to be. I mean, I've lost my parents to the Trump cult. I, I know plenty of people that have also. It's scary. It, it really is uh, frightening to see um, when, you know, our loved ones are getting into that QAnon stuff um, and going down those weird uh, you know, YouTube rabbit holes and are coming and being like, Hey, you know, the Democrats are secret satanic Jewish pedophiles who yeah. eat babies. Yep. Like, uh, like wh what? How can you believe <laughs> uh, that? Yeah, like they, um, and they believe this. Uh, and it was Trump that, that did that. And, you know, I, I under like, it's the same thing. I, I understand the, why they have to believe that because, yeah. uh, it's the same thing I've said, even before Trump, like I've said the same thing about like the reptilian conspiracy theory people, you know, the people who believe that, you know, they're all secret shape shifting reptilians, yep. right? The um, Anunnaki. The the Anunnaki. An yeah. Like they're, <laughs> you know, I, I completely understand why people uh have like have to believe that because a lot of the time when you learn a lot of the kind of stuff about how society works and um how uh evil the corporations are and when you start to learn that kind of stuff and you start to learn about you know how fucked we are and you know uh 
it, it's it's a lot easier to believe no those CEOs and those politicians that go along with this that keep us all in this they yep. can't be human no human would do that to their fellow man they must be aliens yep. like that shit like that like I can I can kind of understand why they would force themselves to believe that same thing I can kind of re- understand why they would force themselves to realize that Trump was actually playing 4D chess and fighting some secret blah 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 war against interdimensional yep. alien shapeshifting baby eating wh- whatever you know they have to believe that because reality uh, doesn't show them what they they need to see. You know, beyond they, that, reality or what they scary. want to see. I mean, the reality doesn't show them what they want to see. They want to see Trump as a good president. They voted for Trump. They backed Trump. Right. So now they have to look for, well, if, if Trump's not coming through and Trump didn't make America great again, because, you know, he fuck, didn't even build the wall. Mexico sure as hell didn't pay for it. You know, yeah. um, you know, he failed, you know, all his campaign promises like that. He completely failed on. He completely failed on. So uh, what's the explanation? Oh, well, it's because he's fighting a secret war against, you know, people who are eating babies. And he was so busy doing that. He was so busy. Yeah. yeah. Right. X, Y, Z. Right. So I understand how that kind of uh, and understanding that I think will allow us to kind of deprogram them a little bit. Yep. And bring them back and get rid of because that those are the kind of tactics we need to understand is they have forced themselves to believe this out of like a um it's a defense it, tactic. It's a defense I mean, tactic. It they is, put yeah. all of their cards on the table for one man. They mm-hmm. put all of their their they put their time, their effort, they've risked their reputations for this man. They had to find every way possible to defend him. And mm-hmm. that's you know, once you can break someone out of that deprogramming you know any anybody that's studied the cult you know the occult deprogramming someone from a cult is the one of the hardest things to do because they've been told by that leader that cult leader where to trust you know what sources the trust who to believe and anybody that talks bad on me they're the enemy Mm -hmm. and you have to break each of those things down individually before you can even bring someone out of it um, and sometimes even when you bring them out of it, they still hold that that admiration of the person. So there's always a risk of them falling right back into it. Um, and that, yeah, that's that's dangerous. It, it really is a, um, a a dangerous time we live in. And hopefully we can all bring everyone lost to the QAnon cult, all our family members that we've lost to that, all our former friends that have gotten brainwashed into that. Um, hopefully over the next four years, uh, they're able to see that Biden wasn't actually a, a secret communist planning to, you know, force them all to be femboys and <laughs> issue them cat girl girlfriends or whatever yeah. kind of ridiculous shit they believe, um, which, you know, would be based if true. But, <laughs> you know, the... Uh, it, the the problem is that you know when I think I think we we have a lot of a lot of work to do to undo the harm, and hopefully um, we're able to accomplish that because there's there's been a lot of harm done, and we Absolutely. need to we need to work to undo that because the the shit that's coming next, you know the next Trump is going to be way worse than oh, the yeah. Trump we just had, and Biden is going. To fail, absolutely. Neoliberalism always fails at preventing yep. the rise of fascism, and when it, you know, if there is any sort of real class solidarity that comes into play, you know, um, and if there really is any real big growing class consciousness that happens, you're going to see the neoliberals like Biden. They're going to focus on crushing that socialist oh, yeah. threat. And you oh, yeah. know they're going to side with the next Trump too. Yep, definitely. That's what that's what history shows us happens. Yeah, exactly. And, and so you know we need to make sure that 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 our our friends and family and loved ones that have been lost, um, unfortunately, you know it may be too late for some. And I, I hate to say yes. that, but um, I think we all still need to try. And you know. Um, 
you know, well, I guess that's that's probably where we should leave it then. I, I don't know. Let's leave it on. <laughs> let's leave it on a down note. You know, we had we had a little bit of we had a little bit of comedy in the middle, and and now we brought it right back down to depressing. All right, so <laughs> there, there we go. Uh, maybe we, I guess we could tell a joke. We, you got a joke? Let's end on a joke. Henry, tell a joke. Um. Oh shit! I didn't. I ain't got nothing here. <laughs> I'm not much of a comedian. We need Brian Ellison for that one. Oh, oh no! All right. Well, the joke is there's no joke. There I'll, do, I'll do. I'll do a little dance. There we go. There, there. We could, we could end on. A, end on a dancing note. Oh, Andrew, why don't you tell everybody uh, where where they can find you know your podcast, uh, find out more about you and what you got going on. Yeah, so uh, you can find my podcast on YouTube, uh, The Pod Quest of Bread. You can also find it on Facebook at The Pod Quest of Bread. Uh, we'll be re- releasing an audio only version soon ish. Um, you can find me at uh, on Facebook, uh, Henry Conley Libertarian. And I'm on Twitter. It's Henry C or Conley Henry or some weird thing. Just look for the crazy guy that uh, has uh, Antifa Submarine Commander in his bio. All right. And, you know, you can check out Podcast Tires of Spook at podcasttiresofspook.com. You know, find on Facebook, Podcast Tires of Spook. You can find me on Twitter, uh, you know, find everywhere. You can just find find me. Um, I'm I'm on all the th- I'm on a lot of things. Not on Parlor. You can't find me there. I'm staying the fuck away from that place. Oh, God. Well, that place doesn't exist anymore. But, you know, and then uh you know, if you if you want to you know, the Libertarian Party Socialist Caucus is growing. The Libertarian Party, and we can use uh, as many people as uh, you know are, are available to come help with the project of you know making libertarianism socialist again. So uh, come on down, make help help make libertarianism socialist again. Uh, what was that? M uh, M L uh, M L uh, yeah M L S A. You know we get a little. Melissa, we'll get little hats made up, make, you know, get, we'll get, get, you know. but you know, this is, this is like a Mardi Gras thing. So I guess I got to show my boobs and, uh, I'll join you. Know, you. Oh, there yeah. you go. And, uh, th- thanks for listening to the first ever live broadcast of podcast titles or spook. Uh, I'm James Weeks once again. Henry, thank you for joining. Oh, you're over here. I don't know which, yeah, this side. Yeah. Uh, Thank, thank you for joining me uh, and sweet hat. <laughs> Sing freaking rocks. <laughs> All right. So I don't, I don't know what to do now. Or I think we're still alive. There we Song go. Song and dance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you both for joining us this coup de gras. We definitely enjoyed it. And, you know, nice joke there at the end. Definitely, definitely made me laugh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, yes. Yeah, so hopefully... You will be joining us for the cabaret on Tuesday, James, and we have a very exciting uh, surprise in store for folks. So, you know, yeah. we'll we'll see how that turns out. Come mm. check it out. It is from 10 a.m. 10 p.m. Central on Tuesday, Mardi Gras day, and um, yeah. On that note. It was wonderful having y'all. We will Thank see you. y'all around. Thanks for uh, having going. us. Yeah. Awesome.